uh, good afternoon or good evening to everyone who's watching. My name is Laura, I work at Ira Glass, and today I'm here with one of our lecturers, Dina Zak, and uh, we're going to have a short discussion about Dina's herself, about her experience, and of course the course that she's doing at Ira Glass. So thanks a lot for joining me today. Hello, hope this discussion gives you a good idea on what Aero Class is all about and also some of our training courses that are coming up in the pipeline. Absolutely. So as I said, in this conversation, we want to introduce you as a lecturer uh, for our viewers, for them to kind of see who you are, what you're about and how you got to the point where you are right now. And obviously, as our class is a digital learning platform, um, I think we should begin about, uh, you know, talking about aviation because it's for aviation specialists. So how did you get into aviation? How did it come to your life? Um, I'd say it was more of a natural sequence of events. I like to say that, but it was probably a little bit of both. Um, so my dad used to work for airlines and I've been traveling. Um, but other than that, I actually studied um, for hotel management and majored in financial management and marketing. Um, so the sequence of events happened when I was working at the airport for a large company with 2000 covers for lunch. Um, and one of our customers came into the restaurant and said, well, why don't you join BA? Um, which is British Airways, and there's a job opportunity. And even though I'd majored and studied hotel management, there was always that draw. Um, so that's how it started, really, and I haven't looked back. So you also yourself mentioned that you studied hotel management, and actually you've worked in different industries, you know, including hotel and, and train yeah. industry, I think. So can you say how does aviation differ from other industries then? Yes, for sure. And um, I could talk about this forever, but I'll try and keep it brief. Um, really, the basics are the same if we're talking about revenue management. So, for example, demand, supply, revenue, competitor analysis, all of that remains the same. However, the industries themselves are different in lots of ways and they come with their own complexities. So specifically, what I can talk about is timing of demand, how that's different, um, whether the business is sold direct or indirect, that's quite different within the industries of hotels, airlines and crews. Um, and then there's the complexities of RM systems, automation and how advanced they are, that's hugely different. So let's just talk briefly about timing of demand. So timing of demand is quite different in that hotels normally see their demand come in or their bookings come in within a very close in time frame, say between um, three months to um, day of booking or date of arrival, but really only two weeks before then, depending on where the hotel is. So if you haven't fixed it, it, there's very little time left to do anything about it. Cruise has a longer booking window. Um, mm. People normally book cruises, say, um, a year in advance, year and a half for occasions. And then there is, of course, a closing window as well. But if you don't book in advance on a cruise, you might lose out on the best cabins, the availability, the window cabins. And airlines, of course, depending on route, um, open for sale at 365 or 352 days before departure. Some airlines open six months out, but there is a bit of a difference in the timing of demand than when the bookings come in, business routes versus leisure, etc. The other really big difference is um, how the business is sold. Airlines tend to sell more direct. Over the years, they've honed in on their websites and they can sell direct to the customer. And essentially, the business is just A to B, London to Paris, New York to Chicago, whatever it is. And they might stop over as they connect. Um, and so the business is simpler in a way to explain to the customer and to sell. Whereas if you look at something like cruise, you're talking about the type of ship, the duration of the itinerary, the number of stops it makes, the, and the cabin space, 
Um, so the passenger or the customer or the cruiser who decides has quite a lot of questions to answer and therefore they tend to book through travel agents or people that can explain what they should be booking and a lot of cruise business or the balance between direct and indirect and therefore agent commissions is quite different to that of airlines. Hotels again, um, big brands, IHG, Marriott, um, Starwood, they do try and sell direct but they're governed by the OTAs. So um, if you're booking a hotel, you might want to see the selection within the city where you're going to book and book it that way. And therefore, again, there is a little bit of um, difference in the percentages that are sold direct and indirect. So I'd say airlines have a better positioning in terms of the percentage of direct sold. Um, and then we come to our um, systems, which is really key for revenue management, pricing and commercial. Traditionally, airlines have been at the forefront of automation and revenue management systems. Until today, I think they're further advanced than hotels and crews. But everyone's catching up. So hotels are getting slicker. There's a little more pricing recommendation, competitor web spray, and so is crews. But they're still a little bit further behind. And the reason for this really is that the bookings come in at a very fast pace with airlines in terms of however many flights a day you have, how many seats, and, and the pace of the churn of the bookings coming in is really quick. And therefore, it becomes almost impossible for large airlines, especially, um, to have someone manually change prices. So automation, demand forecasting algorithms, all of that is much more advanced with airlines and technology is as well. Um, but I could talk about this forever, like I said that at the start, so I think we should move on. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's quite interesting to see, obviously, you know, kind of looking at different industries, you see different trends and you see different kind of challenges phase, but I guess at, at the end of the day, it's all quite similar then. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. So the, the metrics um, do differ in terms of revenue management, but you still have a yield metric, a volume metric and a revenue metric. They might be termed differently. Yeah, I see. Well, I mean, when I listen to you, it's, it seems like you really know what you're talking about. And I know that because also you've got so many years of experience and um, it's interesting. Obviously, you've worked in different organizations and projects. And I just wanted to ask you, maybe there's like an assignment or, or a project itself that really stood out and it's still kind of you, you think about it and you think that it might have changed your career path. Yes, I can definitely. I mean, I enjoyed most of, you know, I have enjoyed most of my roles over the years and I kind of enjoyed consulting because it's varied and um, gives me the flexibility and I can make a difference and I can see what I've done. But if I talk about assignments and what probably changed my career path is um, when I was assigned to GB Airways, which was a British Airways franchise carrier, and it was on a secondment from BA. Um, and what I had there was a year and a half of turning a business round from being non-profitable into profitability. And the way we really did that is I um, had to train the team and take them with me, put in some reporting, look at the routes, decide on how we overbook, change some um, cabin configs, you know, so I had a lot of autonomy um, but also it was really interesting because it was a struggling business. Um, and since then, I guess it gave me the confidence to do other jobs and take on other roles. Because when you work for um, an organization like BA, it kind of becomes an institution and you don't look outside because it's such a big company, you can move around. Um, but once you start to do something on your own, then you realize there is a life outside and you can do a lot more. So I think that would be the assignment I would um, have in mind. Okay. And you also mentioned confidence and what are another maybe like a most important uh, characteristic or maybe a few characteristics for someone working in aviation, especially, you know, 
kind of moving forward towards the higher roles in there. If we think about aviation, really, it's um, never been an easy sector to make money in. Um, it's highly competitive. There's a whole host of regulations um, and there are impacts beyond your control, like the financial crisis, fuel prices going up or down, governments influencing it. So, um, but in my experience, it's always been diverse and fun, but people leading teams um, in unsteady businesses or competitive businesses have to have a good, strong foundation. So we're not just talking um, about the big ticket items. They have to be, of course, financially savvy. They need to have industry knowledge. Um, they need to be able to take their people with them. So some people management skills, uh, but more so now, um, they need to be more um, agile and flexible to change because the world's changing. So as I really strongly believe that as post COVID, and I didn't want to talk about COVID, but it's here, um, post COVID, as the industry changes and starts to reshape itself, um, leaders have to know what routes and markets to pull out of, where to go in, what new routes become available due to slots. They need to be resilient to change, um, flexible and agile, and above all, have a sense of humor and enjoy what they do. Yeah, I think it goes for any kind of profession. As long as you enjoy something you're doing, that's great. And um, obviously you've left your mark now in the aviation landscape uh, from maybe like the management role and now you went into teaching and you're a lector now. Uh, so I just want to know how that came into your life and was the transition easy into teaching and maybe um, what about your expectations as well? Like did it meet your expectations when you came into teaching? Um, actually, I've always been um, a trainer in all my roles. So even though where I was in revenue management and in at Royal Caribbean and British Airways and in hotels, I've always kind of coached and trained the teams to deliver success. Um, so that was part of it. I've also done some lecturing at a university in Southampton here in the UK um, for aviation students and um, operational research. So that's the sort of thing. But I guess it comes quite easily to me. Um, A, because of, I'd say I'm quite easygoing, um, but also because I think I have an ability to explain complex situations quite simply so that people understand what I'm talking about. Um, but in terms of um, how I'm doing things now, the world's changing. We've yeah. kind of, you know, we're moving out of classroom face-to-face -face training into virtual classrooms or video recorded sessions. Um, so I think I'm evolving with that as well. And I quite enjoy it. it it's varied, you know, things like LinkedIn learning and AeroClass um, coming into play. Um, the world's definitely changing and everybody's evolving with it. So it's interesting. Yeah. And you mentioned yourself and uh, e-learning as I think an industry itself, maybe we can call it like that. It's also kind of, uh, it's, it's as irrelevant as ever, I think these days, you know, given the situation in the world right now. And obviously, as you said, it, it's kind of, I think it, it's becoming a new normal actually to have, you know, a virtual discussion with someone, a virtual classroom. But do you think there's something missing in the current supply of uh, e-learning, especially in aviation? If I, if I think back on aviation training in general, I think there's a lot of inconsistency within the airline industry. It's quite patchy. And obviously I'm just going to focus on revenue management, pricing and commercial for, for the discussion. So what happens is some airlines send their students out for training or used to face to face, but might also have e-learning now. Um, some airlines have in-house coaching um, and some employ graduates and just expect them to get on with it and have a bit of on the job. So I suppose what's really missing is consistency, but also what's missing is um, subject matter expert training in e-learning sessions. So there might be, you know, people like LinkedIn Learning and um, other organizations 
will have generic training like price elasticity or price sensitivity, but this airline specific training is missing. And I think um, the two institutions trying to plug that gap are Aeroclass and IATA, because although IATA haven't started video recording, they have more virtual classrooms, but I think what's really um, good about Aeroclass and recorded sessions is people can actually learn in their own time. So they could sign up for a training session and then um, just have a day job or set afternoons aside and they can learn in their own time. And what they know, they can skip, um, fast forward if you like, um, and what they want to take time and they can go over and over again until they actually get what they're after from the sessions. So I think that if we plug that gap and get some consistency in um, with industry experts, it's going to be huge. So is that what attracted you to our class then? Um, the flexibility and this kind of opportunity to give people, you know, learning materials for, for them to kind of do it at their own time, at their own pace. Yes, I think um, Aeroclass will have a special niche when they get up and running, you know, um, also with the way social distancing has evolved and the fact that uh, people are working from home, I think it's become kind of more acceptable. Um, so I think that's what it was. And for myself, it's also a different experience um, to be able to do it. To put something in your CV, you know, another kind of experience. <laughs> Great. So now that we've talked about uh, our class, I just want you to introduce your course, uh, tell, you know, our viewers what it's about, uh, what it's aimed at, and basically what one can expect from this. Okay, so at Aeroclass, we actually aim eventually to deliver a whole comprehensive suite of airline commercial training. Um, my first course is just a taste of things to come. Um, and it aims to collate all the financial information um, or the impact of COVID on airlines, um, look at different recovery forecasts by market and by business segment, and how all this eventually impacts on demand forecasting, which is the key to good RM. And also, um, over time, um, it also aims to dispel this myth that since demand is low right now, and historical demand has changed so dramatically that revenue management is no longer in play, it's just out the window. This isn't true. So what the course aims to do is um, explain to airline managers, possibly, but also revenue management executives on what actions they need to take to keep their demand um, going in some way where they can still make money and also keeping an eye on the future. Um, so maximizing the opportunities in future and not throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say. Yeah. Can you tell me uh, what kind of aviation specialist this course is most suitable for? Okay, so I would say it wouldn't be, it would be twofold. So the beginners will have a broader perspective on how things are panning out what data they should be looking at to make their decisions. We bring in some sources where they can go and look, thinking outside the box, but also for the more seasoned ones, I am sure that they will gain something from it because we talk about things like how customer expectations have changed. And just to throw one example in, not to give the course away, um, people are looking more at insurance and flexibility when they book their holiday seems quite obvious but what are people doing about it or what are airlines doing about it and how do revenue managers need to react when that part of it changes those are the kind of things that are going to help um, so it'll be revenue managers it might be even broader airline execs like network planning for example pricing rm commercial um, right. maybe, maybe finance, because we talk about other things too. Of course. 
So your course is titled uh, Revenue Management, uh, Demand and Crisis and Prices for Recovery, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to touch upon that a little bit. Um, so it brings attention to adding value and cost reduction. And, you know, uh, I just wanted to ask you just to give a little taste for our viewers what your course is about. As you said, not giving too much away. What are the key elements for those things, adding value and cost reduction, and especially, you know, during this global pandemic? So what I'd like to stress is what we are trying to do with this course um, is, you know, take away. It's not just all doom and gloom. There are some opportunities. And therefore, what we're talking about is value creation. And you still can in, in any time create additional value for the customer and cost reduction. And sure, cost is always in focus, particularly in a downturn. Um, chances are, though, that most airlines have become quite surgical with their cost already, but we still seek to highlight some areas where you can expect to find some opportunity to reduce the cost. But then there's value creation, uh, where we talk about, I've mentioned earlier, how the customer expectation has changed and therefore how you can add value in terms of ancillaries or facilities you offer. Uh, to the customer so that although the demand is low, you need to retain the customers you have and also gain a few new ones. Uh, and more importantly, what we talk about is the do's and don'ts, what you can't do in terms of a crisis, what doesn't look good, um, what might lose you business. So we talk about both sides of the scale. I, I believe it's quite informational. That's great. I mean, let's just kind of keep it a secret a little bit for people to join and <laughs> just kind of, you know, go and uh, look through your course. Um, right. I guess uh, I'll leave it at here. Uh, as I said, uh, let's uh, let people check the course out themselves and, you know, kind of maybe connect with you in the future themselves to discuss this uh, subject matter. But uh, I just want to thank you for joining me. I really appreciate your time. I hope you enjoyed the talk as much as I did. And hopefully, you know, we can have something like that in the future as well. Sure. Thanks, Laura. Nice talking to you too. Thanks a lot, Dennis. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.